It's been a quiet few days in the world of Norwich City. I jest, of course. A new signing at the end of a season and Stuart Webber coming out and doing some post-season media as well. It's been quite the few days of uh, Norwich City content. We're going to dissect that all in the latest edition of the Pinkin.com Norwich City podcast. Welcome back, one and all. We had a, a little week's break. And as I said, these are going to be relatively intermittent, depending on what we have to talk about. There's going to be some quiet points during the summer. There's going to be some busy points as well. But given the chat that we were able to have with Stuart Weber on Friday, coupled with Ashley Barnes, coupled with a few other bits that we're able to talk about today, we thought we'd bring you a fully fledged pink and pod. So I'm kind of south well. And uh, joining us to chat through the last week or so since uh, since we last joined you, I'm joined by Adam Harvey and Paddy Davitt. Um, let's start with with Stuart Weber then, gents, because I think there was uh, there's rarely been as much um, anticipation as much. Um, willingness for for somebody of 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 a Norwich City persuasion to come out and and, and face um, the media and talk to the media and Stuart Webber certainly did that uh, on 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 Thursday when he spoke to our colleagues at Radio Norfolk and Friday as well when he spoke to the local media including us um Paddy let's let's start with you because you were you were the guy who was sat opposite him on that table in in the gun club and I mean the mechanics of it was uh, was a little bit strange it was a big vast empty room with kind of two round tables uh, made up in 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 the left corner as you walk in um what what did you make of it first and foremost what did you make of him I guess is, is probably the the question and, and and his demeanor first and foremost before we get into maybe the substance and various things that he did say and and perhaps didn't say yeah no it was yeah, 18 or so months in the making, that really, if you take it back to probably the last touch point of that nature, which for me was uh, prior to Daniel Farker's dismissal, it was the Leeds home game. And and he, I think he called that round of media to almost counter the, the talk sport led narrative about Norwich were not really having a go in the Premier League and uh, almost stealing a living uh, being in the top flight. But Clearly, a lot of water has flown under that particular bridge from that point to this um, until we were back there again. And um, with that in mind, yeah, there was there was so much to get through. I mean, 50 minutes probably only scratched the surface, really. You'd wanted probably about five days. Um, and the way he was going, I think he might have been up for that because uh, what you, wherever you stand on him as an individual and whether, you know, there's uh, things that need needed to have been done differently uh, in various facets of you know his leadership of the football club. Um, what I don't think anybody would dispute is it's always a compelling listen, watch, read. Um, unlike any other probably figure that I can think of modern day times in terms of Norwich at that corporate level, that leadership off the pitch level um, in terms of, you know, somebody who you can just sit there and basically listen to and um, and not feel that, you know, it's somebody just quoting from a well-worn script, really, um, and telling people what they want to hear. That's certainly something you would never accuse him of doing that. And we have plenty of evidence, again, of that in our touch point and the other touch points that he's done over the last few days. The club interview as well, which he did on Saturday. Well, it went aired on Saturday. I think there was some good stuff in that as well. So if you tie all the touch points he had with various media together... That's a huge, huge volume of talking points. And um, I think my sense, really, yes, and we'll we'll drill in, as you say, Connor, into the substance of, of some of the, the areas that have sparked debate, uh, to put it diplomatically. Um, but uh, again, I, I think moving forward, um, that will be welcomed by pretty much all the Norwich fan base. You might not always, and, and that was underlined again in this touch touch point of interviews like what you hear on every topic. Um, but I think you, you have a clearer understanding now of him, his role, it, his desire to, to move this on and um, and sort of maybe learn from where things have gone wrong, clearly on the pitch in the last two seasons uh, and maybe off it as well for, for other parties. And uh, that can only be a healthy thing and a positive thing moving forward. If this is the start of, again, another cycle of, you know, a feeling that if you're a just a, if you're a Norwich City fan, that you're actually getting answers to some of the questions you probably would have liked to have had posed in this intervening period since the last time. Really, he did a mass media touch point on that format um, where he could be held accountable and he could be asked questions. Um, and as a result, I think 
moving forward in terms of what is now a very key part in this Norwich cycle. Um, that was a good thing. That was a good thing that we, we now have clarity in a lot of areas, you know, from whatever, from recruitment to, you know, the plan to his thoughts on the, the style of play and the Cara Road issues and the fan base and the personal criticism and abuse as he packaged it directed to him. All of those topics now, I think we're, we're, a, we're a bit better informed than we were prior to these, these media rounds. So, um, you know, I'm sure he hasn't pleased everybody. Um, certainly not everything he said will have pleased everybody, but I'd imagine now there is a, probably a sense that, okay, and, and that was my take on it. If you took the temperature on social media in the days and, and hours after the event that, okay, yeah, he looks like he's fully plugged in. He fully fancies it and uh, and he wants to drive it forward again alongside David Wagner um, and together in the immediate term that that the most visible representation of that will be what they do in the transfer window. And we've already seen the first phase of that with Ashley Barnes coming through the door. He won't be the last clearly. And, um, and as a result, it, it feels like maybe internally they understand that this, this isn't tinkering around the edges. Now it does need quite a, a major reset and we can all now watch that unfold uh, this summer and crucially pre-season and then into uh, a big season for Norwich. But I think he said it in the club interview, you know, promotion again will be the aim. I think he said something along the lines of there's one of six places that give you potentially a shot at getting promoted to the Premier League. Their aim clearly, as it was this past season, um, is to be in the shake-up. So um, to do that, there's a lot of work has to happen to the squad. So um, I don't know, I mean, I'll throw that back to you two chaps. I mean, what were your sort of assessments of Maybe not so much the the minutiae of what he said and what he didn't say, but how it went, how he delivered it, how it went across, and and how that's played out with the fan base. Yeah, it was it was it was typical Stuart Weber, wasn't it? I think there was there was stuff in there that you know you'd listen to and go, yeah, I could. And I'm just speaking me personally. Obviously, there I won't get into the specifics points because everyone differs on that, right? It's it's um it, it's completely opinion driven. But for me, there was stuff I agreed with, stuff I disagree with, stuff I found quite bizarre, stuff I thought he, he absolutely nailed. So, uh, I, I mean, you could probably package that as a standard Stuart Weber chat, right? And I think the 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 interesting one for me is um it, is you know you listen to uh, the interview you did with yourself and also the the, the other kind of outlets that, that he spoke to. And actually, a lot of the key messaging was the same, um, which goes to show, I think, him in a nutshell, even though he's got this style that is quite loose and can feel quite kind of ad hoc, I think there is a lot of rehearsal and a lot of planning that goes into when, when he does speak. So, um, yeah, so, some some really interesting stuff. I mean, Adam, I'll, I'll open that up to you because you were... You were behind the camera. I mean, what 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 did you make of 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 him of of the situation? I suppose because there was a a lot of pressure on him actually going into that. It, you know, it probably felt like he had to kind of um, put out a few fires rather than pouring petrol on some. I'm sure he did pour petrol on some to to some people. I'm sure he put them out to other people as well. I mean, what what did you make of it overall? Yeah, I mean, I think he kind of been painted as a little bit of a, a Norwich City villain, I suppose, of, of recent months. You know, a man who's Ultimately failed, you know, his objective in terms of the Premier League and, and the Championship as well last season. But I really thought, you know, he came out and I know, know well, I suppose now I know a little bit more what the plan is. And I think he got a lot of credit for the way he handled himself in, in all the interviews, to, to be quite honest. Um, especially like the transfer front. I mean, a lot of fans, you know, speculate, you know, you sort of see the, the articles linking Max Aaron's future away from the club and Omar Delhi And fans are maybe, you know, a little bit interested in what it's going to look like and the players they're going to try and attract. And we now know, you know, Ashley Barnes is maybe the first of two or three players with that little bit more of an experienced core and they're going to dip into the loan market. And I think now fans could maybe picture it and maybe the excitement for next season's built up a little bit. I think there was maybe a little bit of pessimism at the end of last season that next season's going to be tough. I mean, we kind of spoke about it in the last podcast and we all sat there a little bit like, I don't know what next season's going to look like. But now I think I, I'm a little bit more on board with it. I can see the plan. Stuart Webber, you know, you could see he's, He's fully engaged, he's motivated and he wants to you know, bring success back to this football club, even if he's maybe not going to be here in the long term. He certainly wants to set them up for, or set a platform up, I suppose, for the next person to come in and, and take Norwich City to the next level. So on the whole, pretty impressed, I thought, you know, there's a few questionable points which maybe, you know, have been raised, I suppose, across social media and I'm sure we'll get into those. But um, certainly in terms of the transfer front and, and his motivation for the job, I, I don't think you can question the plan and, and what's going to happen for sort of the future next season. 
Do you think he answered enough, Pad, about what had gone wrong last season? Because your opening two questions were were kind of on that theme and he seemed very keen to kind of move it on, to try and almost not really engage with those type of questions. There was a lot, obviously, and, and quite candid and quite blunt that they'd failed with their brief, which was promotion. I mean, we've said that all, all season, really. But didn't really maybe dive in and delve into the specifics of exactly what had gone wrong. I mean, is, is that enough for you in terms of being able to, to close that particular chapter? Should he have said more? Should he have delved deeper into perhaps a, a few of the issues that, that were there and that people could see were there? I think it would would have would have been quite informative. Yeah, I mean across across the range of interviews, I've not really, and as Adam rightly said, you know, a lot of the same themes were visited, and and I don't think there was any one interview on this topic where he dissected it in any forensic detail. You know, he talked. I've, I found it a little bit strange when we, when it was you know packaged as well. Even even if we get a penalty at West Brom to go two 0 up in the penultimate game, we're still in with a shout with it. I, I don't think too many probably felt that was the case. Well, well, pick pick your marker after the Sunderland game, maybe, or you know, maybe the game or two after that. Um, so, so if he genuinely felt that even as late as the first half at the Hawthorns in the final away game, I, I do find that a, a very strange take. Albeit, you know, maybe that would have been factually correct if they had won that game. They probably would have been in with a mathematical shout on the final day against Blackpool, but it's all academic thereafter. But. Uh, that to me dismisses kind of, an, and I put those some of those metrics to him: eighteen league defeats, um, five games at Carrow Road to end the season, no goals, no wins, um, ten defeats at home in at Carrow Road. That was the worst record in the top fifteen. You know, none of those really smack of uh, anything other than a long way short of the objective. You know, whether you want to, you know, say it was mathematically still possible going into the final week or not. Um, actually, I mean, it's when he got into later on in some of the interviews when he talked about, and for me, that was kind of almost a backhanded way of actually opening up on the forensic debrief that he does with his core team around him. They do it every season, um, where they do the, do that really under the bonnet kind of, um, you know, deep dive. And, and he's talking about the non-negotiables that they can, David and his team they can be the fittest. That's within their control. So was he, you know, was he inferring that maybe it wasn't the case this time around? They can be the, you know, the best in terms of sports science or, or um, you know, uh, the keeping players fit and those sort of things. Basically, the areas that he seemed to be flagging that they're now looking at for the new season, you have to sort of draw a draw a line. Probably that is that areas that they felt they were slightly not where they needed to be this past season. And if so, they're, they're clearly contributory factors into why. A season that started in such, um, you know, bullish predictions of uh, automatic promotion or at least promotion uh, fell fell a long way short for, for most people. So, no, I don't think we got the forensic element, um, but I, I, I think, you know, the fact that again in another section of our interview he was talking about that the, the, they've now broadened their data department out, uh, and part of that is a reflection of obviously the closer ties with the Brewers and the Mark Atanasio link. Um, if you've got that amount of data funneling through your football club into all areas of the, I mean, he's he sort of referenced it with if I went to the club shop and bought a shirt, their data metrics are now to the degree where they could almost second guess some of the other commercial products I might be interested in. So if they've got the the computer architecture to go to that level in all areas of the business, then you can be sure that they know very well. Um, and of course, we all know, and he referenced it in the club interview, he's, a, he's an avid consumer of F1 and Formula One. And uh, that's a heavily data-driven um, sport uh, in terms of analysis and um, making observations. So I think they'll have all that data and maybe he just took the view that you know in in a public facing type of touch point it's not really for him to sort of really drill down into the data science of it all and uh maybe felt that was probably levels of detail that he, he didn't feel that particular audience would would want to consume if that's the case and that's that's on him but I, if you're asking me do we know now definitively in his mind what were the factors why a season that started off aiming for promotion finished 13th? I, I don't think we got to that point um, beyond more more generalisations of 
as he said in in that kind of that section of the interview, you know, almost uh, congratulating his players and staff for raising expectations, and that it's portrayed as a disastrous season is a reflection on how well in his time that club have done to raise the bar. I've, again, I'm not sure that would have played quite to the to the way he might have wanted it or intended it to do, but. Uh, you know, it, it's almost akin to saying, well, they didn't really fall that short. It's just the bar is now higher. And again, I, I think many would take issue with that. So, no, is the honest answer. I, I didn't get a sense of, in any of the touch points he did media-wise over the last few days, um, outwardly him projecting the reasons why, you know, the, the actual f- finite reasons that recruitment or injuries to players or style of play or... The, the what two coaches were trying to achieve was different or whatever. We didn't get any of that kind of level of detail, but, you know, I think implicit in, in some of his other answers talking about the future were, were maybe areas that they felt they were negligent, that were under their control. You know, it's not fates and fortunes um, in terms of what can happen in a game, but, but in terms of preparation and preparing players and the psychology around that, as well as the fitness and sports science. Um, and that's, of course, why, you know, David... Wagner, um, this preseason is absolutely critical uh, as much as it's about signing new players and different types of player or different players with men- the mentality they're looking for. Ashley Barnes, the first example of that. It will then be about, um, as he said, you know, this preseason compared to a lot of the recent preseasons in terms of longevity, five or six weeks, they haven't had that before um, for various reasons. You know, the, the World Cup calendar and COVID prior to that. Um, so you can sense underlying message there is that they're placing a huge emphasis on this block of five or six weeks when they come back final week in June to the start of the league season, first week of August, is going to be absolutely crucial for David Wagner to uh, embed, you know, his principles uh, on a a newly remodeled group of players um, to, to then implement what we all hoped we'd seen maybe in the first seven games of his reign when they won the first five and you could see a clear style of play, which gets into another point we got into with him. Um, thereafter, it was more of the Dean Smith for me. You know, there was maybe the Blackburn game, maybe the first half against West Brom where you could see an actual, what is this David Wagner team all about, what they're trying to achieve, but nowhere near and off the sample, certainly not comparatively to the first seven games. I would hope now that given a pre-season, given a transfer window, if they get those two right, we will start to see that moving forward. Uh, and if we do, then then the proof will be in the pudding on the pitch. But uh, yeah, no, I think in that particular aspect of the interview, did we really find out from him why they felt it went wrong this season beyond generalisations? I think the answer was no. No, it kind of felt like he was more willing to maybe stick up for people a little bit more. I, I suppose there's an element of protection, isn't there, that, that goes on both of self and of collective. Um, you're going to need a lot of them players again next season, right? So I guess if you if you offer that dissection, which has happened publicly, I, w- I would say, throughout the course of, of this season, probably maybe there is an element of sense into why he, he didn't, uh, and I heard him use this phrase in the club interview, pick at that scab a little bit more. At some point, you've just got to leave it. And, and I can understand that aspect, but I do also think we could have heard a little bit more maybe around what he feels needed to change. But again, maybe he, he got into that. I mean, on that style of poor, uh, play point, Adam, because that's been a, a massive criticism that's been levelled at Norwich really since Dean Smith took charge and there was that transition from Daniel Farker and there was this this shift in 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 kind of um, in, in playing style that perhaps wasn't communicated in the way that that maybe it should have been this desire to go down a more pragmatic route. But even then, you know, you had Dean Smith publicly saying that he was from the same school of thinking as Daniel Farker, and I think he was still trying to maybe present the idea of philosophy. But the 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 reality of that proved very different. David Wagner, and and it's interesting that to hear Stuart Weber, for example, reference that Huddersfield game where they came to Carrow Road and, and won pretty handsomely under him. He he said on Radio Norfolk it would be about dominating uh, on the ball and off the ball. Um, what what did you make of that? I guess did you feel satisfied? Um, in terms of the answers that he gave across all channels that we're going to see a clearly defined style of play? Or do you think that Norwich fans are going to have to accept for now that there's prob- that's probably going to be a little bit mouldable and probably a little bit open to interpretation on occasion as well? Yeah, to me, he didn't really reinforce what we're going to see next season, of course. I remember when when Wagner first arrived, I think Darren Eady sort of posed to him in, in the interview, sort of 
Norwich fans can tend to get behind a style of football that maybe if you don't win, but they've seen something on the pitch that, that they sort of associate themselves with. This is Norwich City Football Club, you know, this is how we play. They can almost accept losing, but didn't really get that sort of memo from Stuart Webber. It was more, you know, I don't know. I think it's difficult to depend on where Norwich City want to place themselves next season, of course, in, in the table. But obviously fans want to see wins. But I think a playing style is what we've been sort of so... Well, I suppose lucky to have it in recent seasons prior to kind of the Dean Smith period, certainly under Daniel Farker, that Norwich City's style of, you know, style of play in terms of football was, was nice to watch and, and they were almost applauded by every sort of club across the country for the way they played. So it's difficult. I think if Wagner can implement what he what he done at Huddersfield, then I think most fans will get behind it, of course. You know, he spoke about that that performance when they came to Carrow Road, Huddersfield and, and turned Norwich City over that evening. I'm sure most Norwich fans would accept that sort of style of football if it, if it brings wins. So, yeah, I think pre-season will be a good indicator of, of where where they are and what it's going to look like, um, certainly going into the season. But um, if it starts badly, you know, and, and there isn't a style of play, then I think those same criticisms that maybe have been levelled at David Wagner and Dean Smith and, and Stuart Webber particularly as well, um, sort of the back end of last season and the season before, um, I think they'll re- resurface and obviously they'll someone needs to come out and answer maybe why that's not the case again. So it's going to be an interesting start to the season, I think, and, and what sort of style of football we're, we're going to see. Yeah, I mean, I mean, Paddy, you, you've spoken to, to Stuart Webber really since he, he walked through the door in, in 2017. And, and, and when he arrived, there was a big emphasis on process and on playing style. And on, I mean, you mentioned it again in one of your questions, this idea that a playing style gets integrated from first team level all the way down to the youngest level in the academy, the, the under nines, under eights, under nines. There does seem to have been a shift in in that policy. And it was interesting to hear Stuart Weber again in, in the chat he did with you concede that maybe they'd gone chasing results a little bit too much, favouring over process. But again, that doesn't really feel like it's changed. So do you think we're seeing a shift in outlook from him now in terms of what style of play is required? Because it, it does feel to a lot of people like it's perhaps become a lot more head coach centric, which at the start he was very keen to avoid. And he was very keen to talk about Norwich City DNAs, whereas now, again, it kind of feels like Norwich City is a football club of lurch from Daniel Farker's playing style to Dean Smith's playing style, whatever maybe that was, to David Wagner's playing style. And it kind of seems like there's this lurch and, and, and maybe even the, the reversion back to what we saw before the structure of the club was changed, where it becomes almost you, you start with a head coach and you work from there rather than perhaps the head coach gets dropped into something, if, if that makes sense. No, absolutely. Well, I mean, let's just, we well, some Norwich fans would like it if we could erase Dean Smith, but in terms of the Norwich timeline, but for, for the purposes of this, line up Daniel Farker and what he's about in terms of how he wants his teams to play. Put a David Wagner team, from the first seven games when he won five of those there, that isn't the same template. That's not in and out of possession a mirror image, is it? We all know that. We don't need to have coaching badges to see that. So clearly there has been a change. And, and Dean Smith was, I, I would argue, some, you know, maybe somewhere in between those two polar opposites in terms of coaching outlook. Um, on that on that answer, he basically started with it wasn't working. You know, I can't remember now what the figure, was it six wins in 49 Premier League games under Farker, but he quoted that stat and to say the old adage, you keep banging your head against a wall, you stop uh, at some point because if you don't, you're going to have a very sore head or I've completely butchered that. But you, you know that 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 is the saying, you need to do something different. Um, and they clearly decided when Daniel left and Dean Smith came in, that was their response to that. That if we keep doing the same things under this type of head coach, with that style of play, when, again, against, let's be honest, more often not in the Premier League, teams and coaches who will play maybe that type of style, but have better players to implement it and maybe even better coaches, if we're honest. So more often than not, you'll come up short. And that was the empirical evidence over a, a season and 15 games or so was it in the second time in the Premier League. So that, for me, was the end of the the DNA uh, element of of the Weber project in terms of that purity of approach. And as you said there, Connor, it transcended who the coach was or even the players. It was that club-led philosophy set the tone, obviously, by the sporting director, um, that a kind of a seamless transition as you move through the age groups, as you even go to broaden it out to go recruit players. You're recruiting players for a very clearly defined style. Um, but... Clearly, internally, the, the decision was made that that isn't going to achieve what they, and again, he reiterated it to us, they want, which is to get in the Premier League and this time try and at least have a 
reasonable attempt at sustainability and staying there. Uh, they, under this guy, do not feel that that pure philosophical approach, maybe encapsulated by Daniel Farker's coaching, was going to get them there uh, in the current self-funded model. So they have branched away from that. Um, and as Stuart said, and I'd be inclined to agree, you know, uh, David Wagner's Huddersfield team were very pleasing on the eye in a different way, but they were mightily effective. He talked about the game in the Alec Neal era when they came to Car Road halfway through that season, 16, 17, was it off the top of my head, and 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 won that night and were very good. At, and how they did it was almost an eye-opener. Um, and in that, to me there, that that is a parallel between Farker and Wagner, whereas it felt like Norwich were ahead of the curve a little bit and others were playing catch-up. Um, it felt that Huddersfield team under Wagner were just a little step ahead maybe of the rest of the championship, certainly. Um, if we could get that or something approaching that again, moving forward, then I, I think you'd hear less about style of play because ultimately, what does it boil down to? It boils down to a team that wins games, um, scores goals, and if they do that, then it's going to be fairly entertaining if you're a Norwich fan. If you're not getting those things, then these things matter then because then it's why 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 are we going to watch why are we investing our time we're investing our money you know the 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 drudgery of going to car road this past season um would have tested the patience of a saint uh, so that's why style of play matters in that context but let's be honest I, I don't want to speak for norwich fans but if dean smith was a a set piece coach who'd ground out one goal wins all the way through and that had gotten back to the premier league right now nobody's uh batting an eyelid. Everybody's uh, right behind Dino and his green and yellow army and on they go to the Premier League. So I think Weber did make that point in one of the other interviews that a lot of these theoretical debates really all flow back from results. That's what it boils down to. And results have been nowhere near good enough in the last two years. And as a result, it's natural that people will then ask questions about have we abandoned what the playing style was? Why can't we get back there? Why can't we find a playing style? It doesn't even, for me, would have to be, why does it need to be a clone of the Farker? You know, it doesn't have to be a clone of the Farker football. If it was, as I say, that exciting brand of counter-attacking play Wagner patented at Huddersfield, which got them out of that division, and that we did see for maybe, albeit a brief sample when he first came in the job here, I think I think that's a brand of football that Norwich fans would enjoy watching. You know, teams who get on the front foot, full throttle football, go after players, high energy, pressing, all those things that we've heard that David Wagner wants to implement. But over the piece of however many games he had in charge from January, unfortunately, we, we saw more of the same, which was the previous iteration under Dean Smith. So, you know, it feels like there's tram lines underneath this debate that we're having here today. And, and that is give him a transfer window, give him a pre-season, then let's see. If we're still seeing this haphazard, what is a Norwich team under David Wagner in and out of possession, 10, 15 games into next season, then to take Adam's point, uh, he's going to be coming under some serious heat because uh, then there won't be any real mitigation uh, as to why you can't judge him and judge him harshly because you'll have, have had a body of time then for me, plus a transfer window in a pre-season, to at least start the process of, okay, we know what a David Wagner team is striving to achieve. Um, so it's it's that deficit at the minute between the theory and the practice, and we need it to switch pretty sharply the other side of the summer to uh, tangible evidence on the pitch that, right, OK, we get it now. We like this brand of football. It's successful. It's getting results, and we can row in behind it. Yeah, but even in terms of, of what you've said there, it seems as if we've kind of got to a stage where uh, Norwich City's idea a few a few years ago was what Daniel Farker was doing. I I I, I was under the the illusion, and maybe I've got it wrong, which is which is a possibility, is that Norwich City had a style of play in mind, and they recruited a coach to come in and 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 coach that style of play. Therefore, when it goes bad, you kind of take that coach out and put another one in, rather than completely steering the ship 180 degrees and heading into a different direction because that probably then poses a question of me well how much belief did you have in it in the first place if that makes sense because you're you're not just saying we don't believe this style of football can work under this coach you're saying we don't believe this style of football can work which is With, again well Connor within within the restrictions of what they can do they, they as I say of course, you, but, you, but you, then, can't, you can't go and, and purchase the players to implement that style better then, than then, a lot of the Premier League 
but again, then it raises the question of, well, if, if that's the route that you set off in in the first place, I mean, no one was under any illusions the position that they were in then. They had a financial hole to fill. They were recruiting to that style of play then. They had one Premier League season where they tried to do it and they came up against better players. So, so that's more, why is it taken four years worth of work and process, all of that work which has gone into that process, to then decide, oh, no, actually, this doesn't work. If, if, it, if it's a simple case of, oh, no, this coach doesn't work, then that was the idea of the, the structure, that you're meant to be able to take Daniel Farker out, put someone in who maybe what, what doesn't need to be a carbon clone of Daniel Farker and what he was trying to do, but still had kind of those key principles there. That was always the point that a Norwich team would look and feel a certain way that you could that would make the head coach more dispensable. Instead, it feels to me like we've got to a point where, again, we're talking about well, Norwich, uh, Norwich's idea is now David Wagner's idea and Norwich's idea is Dean Smith's idea and Norwich's idea was Daniel Farker's idea, which, again, maybe I've got it wrong, but from from how it started, that never really felt like what it was meant to be to me. I, I, I don't know. Again, maybe I've got it wrong, which is a possibility. Adam, let's let's bring you in on, on kind of, unless Paddy has anything to add, but let's 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 bring you on, on onto this debate, Adam. I mean, what do, what, what do you what do you make of this style of play point? Because I respect it's, it's subjective, right? Because what I like watching is completely different to what you like watching. But I guess it's more that point of what I said there in terms of the vision that Norwich City fans were sold in, in 2017. And of course, I think everyone understands that the way football works, you have to change and you have to evolve. But I, I think maybe the, the questions of style of play come from, particularly when talking about Dean Smith, but obviously David Wagner is still trying to craft exactly what his team looks like. But I, I guess the argument would be that they've steered completely away from what they put so much love and effort into for, for four years and we're kind of preaching to everyone to kind of trust in if that makes sense if if you're asking for fans to trust in it then when the going gets tough you still have to trust in it as well I guess that's that's probably my, more my point yeah I think that's probably been half the issue it's never really been voiced that Norwich City are moving away from what they were under Daniel Farker I mean Dean Smith came in only had the same set of players but his style of play was very different they didn't really go out and buy players maybe that suited a Dean Smith system whatever that really was I'm not really still 100% certain on what Dean Smith's style of play was but David Wagner's obviously been thrown in halfway through a season with a group of players that probably aren't you know possibly able to play the sort of high press sort of style of play that he wants there maybe fitness levels aren't up to the levels that you'd need to be able to play that style of play either um, so I think the summer transfer window maybe gives them the opportunity to of course address those problems um they can bring in the players that maybe suit David Wagner and what he wants to do he's got the pre-season to you know build up the fitness levels and, and Weber spoke about them being and Wagner as well about sort of being the fittest team in the league next season that's free you know they don't have to have you know sort of endless pots of money to be able to do that they can be the fittest team in the league with you know a, a really grueling pre-season schedule which it looks like that's going to be the case so my bigger concern is then if it doesn't work for David Wagner and his style of play, what route do they go down then? Do they try and bring in another manager that maybe plays a, a similar style to what David Wagner does? Because at that point, you'll have a, a group of players that are maybe suited to, to a David Wagner system. And, and then do you end up in that cycle where you're just bringing in managers that maybe don't really have a, a style of play sort of you know, that links to the to previous manager? I mean, I think there's teams in the Premier League that are maybe finding that at the moment. I mean, Leeds United are a prime example. You know, they've gone from Bielsa to Jesse Marsh and then Garcia and now they've got Sam Allardyce and they've got a group of players that are very similar to what Bielsa had and they're now trying to play a sort of Sam Allardyce style of football so I think that's probably what needed to be voiced a little bit earlier and I think now maybe it's out there fans will accept that Norwich are moving away from a Daniel Farker sort of Daniel Farker style of play and this is what we're going to be now we're going to be a David Wagner high press inside and maybe it's not going to be that free-flowing exciting football that fans may be associated with but if it brings goals and it brings wins then I think every single Norwich fan will accept that uh, moving forwards and I think there's a lot of teams that have done you know sort of managerial change as well I mean Brighton are a prime example you know they went from Graham Potter to De Zerbe and it seems like a lot of their values were aligned those two managers but maybe De Zerbe had a slightly different plan in the way he wanted to play and it's obviously you know they're getting the fruits of that at the moment so I think if David Wagner can sort of implement what he wants then uh, there's definitely a route for success but I think certainly in the future Norwich probably need to bring in managers that align to the players that they've got in, in the squad. 
Yeah, and, and that that kind of is my point there. I mean, you you mentioned it. Brighton have been have been so good, and and that I, I know they're a very extreme example because they're at a different level entirely. But you look at those two appointments. Why did they work? Because there was some continuity about them. Because they were dropped into a wider club structure. It doesn't feel like Norwich are that at the moment. It, again, we're kind of talking about recruiting to David Wagner's style of play. We're talking about recruiting to you know you've got a mismatch of players who were signed for Daniel Farker's style of play. Then Dean Smith, which was athletic and, and 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 physical, and now we're talking about recruiting for David Wagner and speaking about mentality and experience, and they all feel very different. And that's that's probably the point that I'm looking at, and maybe saying what exactly is this? Because if David Wagner, as you said there, really well loses a few games, suddenly again, do, do you then lurch in a different direction? And the point of this structure, I felt, was to kind of eliminate that short-term thinking of working manager to manager, where Norwich got caught in before, where they were trying, they were signing players under Alex Neal, and obviously had that window on the Chris Hutton and it didn't quite all fit. And the idea was that you bring kind of everything in, you connect all of those strands, and almost the head coach then gets dropped into that as well, in the same way that uh, you recruit players for a certain style of play, you recruit a coach to execute a, a certain style of play, and this is where it maybe feels a bit sort of mis misaligned I suppose for me at the moment but um maybe 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 what Norwich are trying to do under David Wagner now is what they want to do for the future but again it, it doesn't hold much hope because you put so much belief in what they were trying to do in 2017 and that style of play to then go away from that I mean when the going gets tough with this style of play and it will do at some point eventually do you then rip that whole thing up and go in a completely different direction? I don't know. I mean, it's um, it's probably a wider debate, but that's an interesting one to keep keep an eye of. I mean, just to, to shift this on, Pat. I mean, how much did you did you take from Stuart Weber in terms of the future? Because I think there were some people, and I saw this on on social media. I spoke to to quite a few Norwich fans over the weekend as well, who who said this to me as well um, that maybe they they did for what you said about the past, they maybe didn't quite get enough of maybe what they wanted to in terms of the future and that clarity in terms of what the idea again I mean you, you spoke to Stuart Weber about project and again kind of repeated that we want to be in the Premier League we want to be established in the Premier League and there maybe wasn't that kind of process element that there was in in 2017 again I know there's a lot of comparisons back to that point um what did you what did you take from him in terms of his messaging about the future direction of travel going forwards for for Norwich City more, more generally Oh, I mean, we've just come off the back of a debate about it feels like the style of play and the philosophy element of it is is probably jerked in a different direction. But I, I think in this point about what they're striving to do, now, the plan, if you want to put a label on it, he's, to me, sounded like it was more of the same, that it's about the pillars of developing good young players that obviously have the resale value as well as improving your first team. Um, the infrastructure elements, he, he talked those up as well. You know, and accelerating that as so, I, I think he sees the route within the self-funded model, and and you know there was nothing in the Atanasio sections of the interview that suggested there was in the short term, at the very you know least, going to be a huge cash injection coming. I mean, I asked him directly, will the Atanasio serve up any money for him in this transfer window? No, was the answer categorical. So, you know, within within the current parameters of of how the clubs set in terms of the course at the very top of the club, currently Delia and Michael, increasingly potentially the shift to uh, the Americans, that doesn't sound like it's going to change anytime soon. So if that's not changing the direction of travel, then the, the steps that you try and achieve it, um, in his mind, clearly are do what you're doing now, but do it better, uh, essentially. And, you know, that's, as I say, moving it on from how do you achieve that on the pitch in terms of you know the, the 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 footballing element of it, but on a broader level, on a broader canvas, um, they just need to be better. Uh, my sense from him was at doing what they've done thus far, and you know where they've made mistakes, learn from them. Um, you know, he talked up again the, the the data element, and they they clearly feel there's an edge to be had there, and the South American scouting and the work that's gone in there to put that infrastructure in place. That, I think he said his words to me were that South America will be a big market for this club moving forward. So it's just an acceleration of processes that they are have put in place, are putting in place and continue to put in place because he feels that it's those elements that will, as it has done, as he's right to point out, twice before got this club under his stewardship out of the championship and into the Premier League. We know what happened in the Premier League, um, but certainly the challenge they face now is a challenge he's overcome twice before. So it's, I think it's natural that he would fall back on the, the fundamentals of 
what he put in place um, to do that two previous times. But you know, it, it does feel that this is a very different landscape um, in terms of how they're going to try and achieve it this time around because, uh, you know, the, the squad, it, for me, it all comes back to this summer and this squad. How how do you remould this group of players to really be an effective fighting force at the top end of the championship? But I think the jury's out until we see what the rest of the transfer business looks like. But even then, you know, the onus is on Wagner to very swiftly assimilate all of that um, and, and, and produce a group of players who all understand what's being asked of them and can implement it, you know, and when he reeled off the succession of young players of which there was a huge amount, you know, it's, it's a huge challenge to, to, to bring that group, that level of young player together to turn them into a team who are really ready to go this season coming now in the championship at the right end of the table, you know, the clubs that will come down, the clubs who've been building steadily in the championship, it feels like they're all ahead of Norwich. But as he also said, you know, go back to 18-19 when the ball kicked off in that season, no, nobody gave them an earthly of doing what they went on to do. Um, so we, we can't at this stage of the summer write off next season. But it, it just feels like quite quite an epic challenge ahead um, to do everything they need to do to get this club in the shake-up for promotion next season. But as I say, you know, time will tell. But um, but how the plan looks moving forward, I think it's more of the same. And under this sporting director, in this model as it stands, um, they're not going to they're not going to veer away from from the the the, the pillars that that he has constructed and that have, as I say, to repeat myself, twice before at this level proved sufficient to get them out of the division, albeit under a different head coach, maybe with a different philosophy, but. David Wagner would be swift to remind us that he did get a team out of the championship. So, you know, he has that on his CV, uh, as did Dean Smith, of course, and that didn't end quite as favourably as we'd all hoped. But, uh, yeah, in terms of the plan and what it looks like, it's not it's not going to be any different to the plan as it was now, as it has been since he moved in the building. You know, within a self-funded model with all the limitations, uh, there's only certain areas that they can really look to, or avenues they can look to go down. And uh, everything you see so far is... I think it's just going to be a continuation along that path and uh, just doing things better, basically. Indeed. Um, just just finally then, Adam, I mean, you, you touched upon this earlier and then I, I want to talk in maybe some of the more controversial things that, that Stuart Webber said and, and, and maybe the ones who, that have got the most reaction. And what, what, what did you make about the talk of recruitment? It feels, I mean, we've, we've been reporting this all summer, really, that it looks like Norwich would look to the free transfer market. It looks like they're going to look to the more experienced market as well. And that's probably documented the first step has been taken in, in recruiting Ashley Barnes, who's, who's 33. And uh, as I, I tweeted a long list of their 30 plus year old signing since uh, Dion Dublin in, in 2006, he's the, the oldest permanent player since Dejan Stevanovic in 2008 who was uh, two days older than Ashley Barnes I think when he signed and uh, I think if you want loan signing then, then you're going back to Joseph Yobo in, in, in 2014 so it's not a route that traditionally they've taken either under Stuart Webber or really much in, in the last uh, decade or so but it, it's all about this balance I guess to the squad and maybe that they feel those intangible elements that those experienced players can give them provided with that youthful exuberance and maybe the quality that those young players have can blend together a, a squad that's capable of, of challenging in, in, in the championship I mean what, what are your thoughts on that do you kind of agree with that policy that, that, that they're adopting this summer? Yeah, I think sort of when you first see, you know, the links of Ashley Barnes, maybe it doesn't really fill you with much excitement for what the season's going to entail for Norwich City. Those sort of high experienced players in the championship typically aren't the route that Norwich City go down or certainly under Stuart Webber, they've never been the kind of signings they've brought in. But after hearing him speak about it and, and kind of the fact we saw at the end of last season when they lost a lot of those experienced players at the side, they really, really struggled. So I think maybe having those kind of leaders, that the players that have been there and done it before, probably is a huge benefit to them. Um, Ashley Barnes obviously suited a system for Burnley with lots of sort of young attacking talent around him. And they obviously reaped the benefits of that because they won the league at a canter. So if Norwich City can get something out of, you know, the likes of Ashley Barnes, Similar to that, then, yeah, there's, there's a route to success. I mean, even Sheffield United are another good example. Lots of experienced players on their bench when they came to Carrow Road. And again, they finished second in the league, but they also had those younger players in there, you know, the likes of McAtee and, and Doyle, which if Norwich City can kind of use that as a blueprint and, and build off that, then I think 
most fans would get excited because I felt Sheffield United and Burnley were two of the better sides to come to Carrow Road and I enjoyed watching both of them. So I think there's a route to, to using that kind of transfer policy. Then why not go for it? I mean, these players are ultimately free signings. Of course, there's a, a wage you know, linked to that, but ultimately it feels like a little bit of a low risk signing the likes of Ashley Barnes, which has a potential for quite a huge, um, you know, sort of well, route to success. So um, I'm excited to see what it's going to bring. Of course, they're going to lose a lot of the young talent in their squad as well. I mean, he kind of mapped out that Max Aaron's is it's his time to move. I mean, Omar Delhi, it feels like particularly that there was interest in January that he's going to get more interest this summer and potentially a route out of the football club is, is where it's going to end for him. And I'm not surprised to see someone like Gabriel Sara having high interest. We kind of saw the the way he started to to mould himself under David Wagner in those early games. And there's definitely a player there that's probably going to end up in the Premier League. So it's going to be interesting to see which one of those you know players Norwich City can keep. Um, I think if they can keep hold of a Gabriel Sara and build around him with the experienced Championship players and those young talents on loan from you know the top elite teams in England, then you know mix that in with a bit a little bit of South American flair. Yeah, I'm excited to see what next season is going to bring because you know as I've already referenced, so if they can build off the success of the teams that are already doing it in, in the Championship, then um, and got themselves out into the Premier League, then uh, yeah, there's going to be a uh, Hopefully some good football to watch next season at Carrow. Yeah, such a fine balance, isn't it, when, when you take that approach? And it's just about hopefully striking the right one, particularly if they're going to lose two of their, their younger players. Although I'm sure, and he mentioned this as well, they will recruit players who who are under 30 and are maybe in that peak bracket. And then those those maybe development type players, and we've already seen uh, Motherwell's Mac Johnston um, pretty heavily linked, someone that, that we understand has been to, been to Colney to, to have a look around in the same way that Ashley Barnes did. So uh, he's only 19. So there, there is probably going to be a blend in that approach. I think that's, that's, that's fair to say as well. Um, Paddy, it wouldn't be a Stuart Webber interview if there weren't a few uh, controversial elements that maybe we we needed to to chat through. So let's let's try and do them in in order. Um, let's start with the the point about uh, abuse that he spoke about, which you know I'm sure nobody would would really disagree with in, in terms of the way he framed it, in terms of the the type and level of abuse that he uh, has had to endure. And I think we we met, we mentioned this even as early in, uh, as the podcast after Newcastle, where. You know, we, we kind of spoke about it, that level of, of, of abuse where it's not constructive, where it's personal, that's not helpful to to anybody really. And and all it does really is probably damage the wider message in terms of, of criticism. And and um, and, and yeah, it's, it, no individual should be obviously um, exposed to that and, and nobody should receive that in, in the way that he has. And I'm sure his experiences are, are, are very real and. Um, and probably very f- painful, as he said, for, for his family. He's got a, a young son, obviously a wife and a wider family as well, who I'm sure have been affected by it. I think the issue in terms of, of that particular comment and, and those partic- that particular route that he went down was the, I, I don't know, maybe comparison probably isn't isn't a fair word to use, but maybe the link that he made to, to the type of stuff that Darren Moore, Sheffield Wednesday's manager, was was receiving after their... After their um, Semi for first leg semi final playoff defeat to Peterborough when they lost four nil. That of course obviously um, was more kind of racism, which um, got picked up in in a lot of national media outlets. Which I, I kind of get what he's saying. I, I want to say it was probably clumsily phrased. And again, he, we spoke about key messages. This is a point that he made in all of his kind of conversations that that he had with various different outlets. Um, the issue I have with this, and again, I I, I totally get where he was coming from. And I, I don't think he was doing this, but I, I think there's maybe this this perception amongst some who have maybe taken that to be him e- equating the two, um, which, again, I don't necessarily think he was doing. I think he was more talking about how society more generally, we've gone on quite a tangent in this podcast now, but maybe how society more generally um, picks up and condemns certain types of abuse more. I think that's probably the point that he was making, but I think it came across as him maybe equating it. And I think, you know, it's worth making absolute clear um, just from our perspective more than anything else that you know the abuse that he has received which is terrible and and we have condemned and, and will continue to condemn is not no one's abusing Stuart Webber because he's a white man right like that 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 is not a, an abuse and, and 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 something that he's being abused over the abuse that Darren Moore received was because he is a black person he is he is a, a, a black man that's the abuse that he was getting so I guess some people are looking at that and saying to put those on the same level, the abuse that he received and the racist abuse that Darren Moore received is, is not an equal level. I mean, what, what, what 
pad would would you kind of say to uh, about that because again I, I think it was him being clumsy rather than him doing that but some people have taken it in in, in that way and, and and to an extent when you look at the quotes I can kind of understand why they have done that I just don't necessarily think that's how he he intended them to come across if that makes sense not that I'm you know it's not our job to speak to speak for him and and, and say exactly what he meant well for me I mean in this area I mean it is it's a it's a very delicate area in in general. Abuse is abuse, as as he said. Um, and he's in this regard, he's consistent. He's consistent in his messaging because he was saying the same thing around Dean Smith. What was the quote around when he unveiled David Wagner back in January? It was the abuse that Dean Smith uh, received was out of order. I'm paraphrasing here, but you know he's a white fifty two year old male or whatever. It was something along those lines. You know, as if it was unacceptable due to his gender and his ethnicity and, um, you know, his age, maybe, I don't know, but um, that's his opinion. And, and ultimately he, in terms of this aspect we're talking about here, he, he is the person who has been subjected to that abuse. So I, I'm not going to sit here and, and talk about really his right to talk about that or his right to equate it in his mind to the racist abuse that Darren Moore received or any type of abuse um, because he's, He's the person who's had to deal with that and deal with for that for quite a number of years. I re, I recall an anecdote in the first season, the, the the first Farker season, where they were pretty poor on the pitch, um, and and there was a, there was an incident around the Easter time, um, and uh, and then he made it clear that you know he was getting abused with his son as he left Cairo going going to his car after games, and and that was. X amount of months into the job, we're now six years into the job, and and the abuse is is still there, and you know that's a that's a hell of a toll or a hell of a burden to have to carry around when you've got a young family. So you know, I'm I'm not, I'm definitely not going to get into you know should he be saying those things? Should he be equating them with any other types of abuse? He's experiencing it, he's living it, that's his life, and that's what he feels. So in in that setting, he was asked about it, and and that's you know that's his opinion. So. Um, I don't think it's for any us or anyone to pass judgment on. If I'm, if I'm brutally honest, really, uh, as I say, I, I've not had to walk in his shoes. I don't think any of us had. Most of the people listening to this podcast or watching this will have had that level of direct abuse. And as he said, and he was at pains to stress, you know, criticism all day long. You know, he's made he's multiple errors that he's made in his six years here, and and he deserves criticism, as he said flippantly. Those ones who were shouting Weber out in those last two home games, he felt like joining in because one win and eleven is is an unacceptable return, and he's the person who the book stops with. But as he said, and this might be, to be honest, why he he's quite so overtly, for some, provocative in these type of areas when he's asked questions because he, as he said, he he'd rather he was the human shield, he'd rather he would be the front man for people have got issues with the club or players, or whatever pile in on him. He'd rather take that and deflect that from others. And this might be part of that as well, you know, because he's a very, as you said, Connor, earlier on, you know, I don't think he just, it feels like he speaks off the cuff and it just, you know, the words tumble out. But I think he's far more calculating than that and and um, far more astute in, in what he wants to do. Obviously, there'll be others who say, well, you know, his messaging, uh, he could stop and think on occasion, but that's just him. That's the type of person. As he talked about in this area, you know, he was bullied uh, at school or, or as a young person. And from that point onwards, he, he vowed that he would always stand up to, to bullying as he, as he perceived it. And, and he's not going to take a backward step. As he also said to me, you know, there's friends who've said, stop and be careful what you, you, you say. Don't, don't say those things. You don't need to say those things, but he clearly feels that strongly about it. He's going to say it because, because it's him and it's his life and it, he's had to live with this. Um, so, you know, for me, I, I'm not. I'm not going to pass any judgment on on what he had to say about abuse um, because I've I've not had to experience it. And if we'd had to experience that level of abuse, as a, distinct from criticism, then you know we might feel the same. Uh, whether whether we would we would go front foot or two footed and and put that out there, well that that maybe is a reflection on the individuals uh, who we're dealing with here. But you know all I would say is what he said in that interview was kind of what he said when Dean Smith was dismissed and. And probably what he said in in then if we were to go and delve deeper into any touch points that he's done in the last six years regarding uh, criticism and abuse. Um, so you know you can't suddenly say that he's he's departed from whatever his viewpoint is in these areas. He's just remained 
unvarnished and um, brutally honest. And um, as always with Stuart Webber, you, you take it or, or you don't take it, or, or you, you take it and you you see there's mitigation, or you 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 say, well, how can you come out with those things? And you know that's that's wrong fundamentally. But for me, you know, nobody should be subjected to any level of abuse, whether it's gender, ethnicity, sexuality. Um, but unfortunately, as as anybody has any dealings with social media would know, um, that's not the world we live in. And unfortunately, we all have to deal with the consequences of that. Yeah, I'm, I'm more on this topic, Adam. I mean, an, another quote that, that got quite a bit of an, uh, attention, and he gave this to our colleagues at, at BBC Radio Norfolk, and he was talking again on on, on a kind of similar theme. Um, <laughs> it's this quote here, and I'll, I'll read it verbatim. He said, I, I'd never move on because of, without being rude, a few divorces in the snake pit abusing me. I'm not going to let them ruin or change the course of my career. I refuse to do that. Um, I mean, what, what do you make of that? Because it is a part of the ground that has probably displayed that element of, of abuse towards him at, at, at various points. And I'm sure the people who, who sit there would, would accept that. By the same token, is it particularly helpful? Uh, is maybe the word I would use to to come out with a, a quote like that about a section of of your own supporters? I guess to a lot of people, it, may, it maybe feels a little bit unnecessary again. But as as for all the reasons that Pad said there, it probably wasn't particularly unsurprising. I mean, what, what do you make of that particular element of it? Yeah, I mean, I'd say that sort of area of the ground typically are quite supportive of the team when they're playing. I mean, they're very vocal that and the Barkley in terms of their. Support for the team on the pitch, of course. You know, they've obviously chanted for, for various Weber out kind of vibes during the season, which is absolutely fine. He spoke about, you know, the levels of criticism are absolutely fine. Obviously, if it reaches a level of abuse, then that's not okay. It, you know, in any sort of walk of life, that's that's not okay, depending on what job you are or, you know, as Pad outlined, any kind of race, ethnicity, sexuality, that's, you know, it's not acceptable on any level. But particularly, I think, to, to categorise that whole group as as one kind of collective, it is probably also factually incorrect. I mean, it's okay. You kind of see it on, on you know, various strands of social media that there might be a, you know, a set fan from a set football club that doesn't, you know, make every single fan from that football club, the exact same, you know, they're all from, you know, cut from the same cloth almost in terms of an issue. So I don't think that helps the situation. It, it probably just pours more petrol on the fire, particularly early next season. If something goes wrong and, and Stuart Webber's, you know, in for, for more criticism, I think it probably gives that group or of the snake pit, you know, almost, I suppose, a bit more of a, a sense that maybe they'll go for Webber even more. So I, I don't think it's a helpful comment. You know, he can think it internally, but maybe don't, you know, put that out there on record and, and sort of group one set of supporters who are, are passionate about their team as a sort of, you know, a, a group of divorcees, as he uh, put them. So not very helpful comment in my eyes and one that, you know, might come back to bite him more if if things don't go well at the start of next season. Yeah, I mean, I, one, one thing I would raise is what's so bad about divorcees anyway. But, but you know, maybe that's a, a different point altogether. I mean, I, but the thing is, like, you swap divorces for people, a few people, and, like, it becomes a completely different quote. So maybe, maybe again, it's just the, just the way he is at, at, at points. But, um yeah, I, I just a little bit unnecessary for me, and I, I think when when you know there's so much spotlight on you, probably something that he, he could have done without. And then, and then finally, I guess we we kind of bring ourselves to the quotes that have surfaced over the weekend. This was um, part of an interview that he did with uh, with Michael Bailey at the Athletic, um, speaking about women. He was asked about women's football, um, and uh, the quotes that that were picked out were how he had no interest in it. Um, kind of doubt, I, I guess. Um, being quite critical of the, the overall quality of it, speaking about being one game or going to one game, not really having an interest in it. And um, I mean, for me, I, I, I find the quotes and, and and I know, Pads, when, when I hand over to you, you'll be keen to maybe apply some more context to them, which is, you know, really important and absolutely necessary. But for me, I, I just I just find them a little bit sad, if I'm honest, um, because that's that's one area of the football club this year that has been a real positive and has made real progress. Um, and ultimately, it's a it's a department of the football club, right? I, I don't think you would get a uh, major figure of Norwich City in, in a different area say, yeah, I you know it's great what the academy are doing, but I, I haven't really got any interest in it, or you know it's um it's not really a value or something like that. I, I just feel you know for the girls who are playing, for the people and the volunteers who put so much effort and time into that project, um, 
it's it's a, a a bit of a kick in the teeth for them personally, really. But also, you know, there's a reason why the quality is where it is. And that's because, you know, for a long period of time in this country, women weren't actually allowed to play football by by the FA. And in, in that time, men's football was, um, you know, you had boys who were exposed to coaching, who were exposed to infrastructure, who were exposed to academy. And, and that has obviously grown subsequently since the Premier League formed and, and, and the money in the game has become significantly more. So I, I don't think it's a fair comparison to make first and foremost. Um you know, I, I would say out of all the days I've had at Carroll Road this season, the one for the women's game was probably the most enjoyable, really, both in terms of atmosphere and in terms of entertainment. So, you know, again, it's subjective. I don't necessarily think that him saying he has no interest in it is an issue because, you know, I, I don't have interest in in lots of sports, really. But uh, I wouldn't then go to say, oh, I, I don't like baseball uh, and I think it's rubbish. And, you know, the the uh, the demographic of it isn't particularly great. So, um yeah, I, I, I just I just felt a little bit sad around those quotes, if I'm honest. And I can I can understand why people uh, are feeling upset about them. I can understand equally people just saying, well, you know, it's an opinion, whatever. But your words do hold weight when you're a sporting director of a football club. And, you know, by very token, I, I, I guess you're linked to, avertedly, inadvertently, to the progress of the women's team, particularly when I feel like he has so much he could do to help that side, to help progress them. You know, if you're if you're a player now, are you going to knock on his door? I, I'm not sure you are, and and that that feels like a little bit of an issue for me. But Pad, I'll hand over to you anyway because I, I I know you want to reply some context, which is important as well. I mean, just just talk to us about what what you made of uh, of his comments on on this particular area. Well, I concur with a lot of what you said, Connor. I mean, ultimately, it might be his own personal opinion, but he's doing a round of interviews where it's very clearly Norwich's sporting director speaking. So. I find it strange, very, very ill-judged. Um, but we're not in the room, so we don't know. We don't know the context. We don't know what part of that interview, what preceded it, what came after it, what the general mood was in the room when that interview was taking place. So, you know, I'm loath to, you know, extrapolate all the context because we wasn't there. We wasn't there. We simply wasn't there. We don't know. You know, at, at what point that interview, uh, that part of the interview, verged onto there. But that's by the by, I mean, he clearly the transcript is out there. You can you can see it also there, which is you know in terms of balance. You know, he talked about what a great occasion it was. I've got the quotes in front of me. It brought a completely new fan base to the stadium to see what the business offers. He later on talks about you know his son absolutely loved it. You know, loved the sort of the musical elements to it and just the uh, the general sense of fun um, and and excitement which was in the stadium. You were there, Connor. You would have felt that as as the seven and a half, that seven and a half thousand, absolutely phenomenal. So that, that, that tells you, that stat alone, the attendance tells you how important this women's team are to the community of Norwich, Norfolk, and that they should be got behind and they should be pushed forward within the broader context, as you say, of growing the women's game off the back of the success of the Lionesses. And of course, within the Lionesses, Norfolk's own Lauren Hemp. So, I find it a very, very strange comment to, to to wrap his own personal viewpoint in with what a great afternoon, what a great um, illuminating moment for the women's team in Norwich and Norfolk more broadly, and and not to celebrate that, which he did in the rest of the quotes in that section. But um, yeah, as I say, I, I wasn't in the room, so I'm, I'm you know. I'm loath to to, um, to to talk as if I was in the room uh, and I was there fully to listen to the context. But from the quotes, as they've been reported, um, you know, I think if he had his time again, that he'd probably realise that that probably was um, very ill-judged and, um, and doesn't do him any favours and doesn't cast him in a very good light. Um, and you'd hope that that message has been uh, communicated to him by others inside the football club who have worked so hard um, to grow that women's team, culminating, of course, in not just one, but two Carra Road occasions. And I think you also said, didn't he, in, in those quotes, that there'll be two or three potential occasions next season when the women's team will, will be back at Carra Road. So, you know, it jars with what the messaging should be from inside the football club, and particularly him as the most high-profile, most visible figurehead of the football club. Um, it... It's not. It's not good. It's not conducive to uh, a sense that that the club are absolutely four square behind what the women's team are trying to do, and uh, the fact that it was integrated at the start of this season um, 
you know, it just underlines you know, that there's a journey there where they, they need to continue along that path. And, and, and I'm sure, you know, if he had his time over again, uh, and like in maybe some other more combative areas of his various touch points that he did, uh, he probably wouldn't have wrapped his own personal opinion around, you know, his reflections as a club spokesperson, which he was on, uh, on that unbelievable occasion. So, um, yeah, not not great, not a great look all round. I don't think. No, I, I don't. I don't want to speak for 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 the girls here because um, it's not my job to speak for them, nor would I want to. But I, I've spoken to a lot of them at, at various points this year in in touch points that we've had. Obviously, a lot before that that Carrow Road game, and and they spoke about the integration. And you know, a lot of those girls were playing for Norwich City when they were playing at Plantation Park, and nobody was really going to watch them. And they had the Norwich badge on their chest, but they, you know, they had to pay for their own travel. They had to pay for for meals on the way home from from games. They weren't part of the club, as you say, they weren't integrated. So, I think you know it's been a long road for them to get to where they are in terms of acceptance, and for them to feel like they're a part of the football club. I, I can imagine a few of them are, are feeling a little bit, um, and again, I don't, I don't want to speak for them, but I, I think if I was in their shoes, I, w- I would feel quite upset about the, uh, uh, the comments because all of the work and all of the strides they've tried to get to just to be accepted as a Norwich City team, park anything else about being successful and, and whatever, but having that equal opportunity of wearing a Norwich City shirt, but actually deeper than that, feeling that connection to, you know, almost be told that the quality isn't great and, you know, that, that someone who, is in the club that you look up to doesn't maybe um, have a particular interest in it. Even if that's true, you know, it, I, I just don't think it's, it's particularly helpful. And, you know, again, the comments around attendance and pitch, well, you know, Norwich's under 18s played at Carrow Road a few weeks ago and they played that game behind closed doors. So I'm not sure why we're kind of um, saying that that's a game worthy of, of that, but equally, you know, women have to get a certain threshold in terms of attendance to, to play their matches there. So, um, yeah, like you say, there's there's a lot of context that, that has been missed, I'm sure, in the comments that, that have got out there and a lot of, you know, as you say, we weren't in the room and that's that's a fair point to make. But um, yeah, I, I can't help but but feel a little bit, um, yeah, a little bit sad for the girls, but, but also, you know, for women's football more generally. I don't think if I'm being, you know, brutally honest, what women's football needs at the moment is another senior male football executive saying that they have no interest in, in the sport. I think there's quite enough of those who have voiced that opinion already. It should be uh, a different message entirely. But yeah, there we go. That Brit probably brings us to a, a nice end on the pod. I mean, there's so much more we could talk about, but we've been going on for well over an hour already and I'm conscious of that. So we'll park it there. Obviously, plenty more analysis, reaction and quotes uh, across our channels from our Stuart Webber chat. You can watch it on YouTube as well, just as you can with these podcasts. We're now putting them out in video form as well. And I've just realized I've got a massive pile of clothes behind me, which is not a great look, but there we go. So sorry that they've been sat there for the entirety of this podcast. Um, there we go. Uh, I think that's I think that's just about it for now. We'll join you as and when is relevant over the summer, really. Um, one thing I did want to mention, I'm not going to bring Paddy in because, again, we're really pressed for time, but it'll kill me if I don't mention that, obviously, Coventry made it to Wembley. So uh, just uh, just for our audio listeners, and then I'll explain to the... Um, uh, for our visual uh, sort of watchers, I suppose, rather than our listeners, which I'll explain what you're doing. Just thumbs up. Are, are you hoping to get to Wembley? Are you going to get to Wembley? Uh, TBC, my man, TBC. Yeah, I've spent... Uh, quite a long period of the previous weekend. Um, it's like Operation Coronation. This trying to get tickets for the extended David Clan. So uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see. We'll see. We've got t- got a few days left. But um, yeah, yeah. Premier League commentary. Who would have thought that when they came to Car Road in September and got beat three nil and uh, Norwich went top that day? How how the plates can shift. Yeah, well, they've they've still got to get there, haven't they? Thank you very much for listening. Appreciate your time as ever. And we'll see you again for the next one very soon.